Good morning. morning. Great to see everybody. Happy New Year. Year. Uh, As John said, my name is Greg Stearns. Um, If you're new here at the church, uh, I'm not on staff. I'm not a uh, uh, pastor or anything. Uh, I've served on the elder board, but um, uh, John, along with uh, Jeff Harper, asked me to to fill in a Sunday, and so uh, here we'll see what the Lord has to say. Um, I want to ask, uh, if you're 10 years old or younger, please raise your hand. Okay, welcome to church. It's great to have you here with us uh, this morning. Uh, there's a nursery this morning, but there's anything for um, anything else for younger kids. So thanks a lot for coming. I appreciate it. I'm going to try not to be too boring and not to go too long. So uh, don't hold me to it, but uh, hopefully. Uh, well, it's New Year's, and you know what's the the thing that many people do on New Year's is to make resolutions. And typically those New Year's resolutions have something to do with being healthier or losing weight or being nicer to others or getting out of debt. Uh, Some people make resolutions, others don't. We've got a few up here, some I found online. Um, You know, I'll make better use of my free time by doing less laundry and using more deodorant. Uh, That could be one. I will not bore my boss with the same excuses for missing work. I'll think of some more creative excuses. Uh, I'll think of a password other than password. I'll eat a more well-rounded diet, like donuts and pizza, since they're both round. Um, I'll learn to use, learn what the word resolution actually means. Uh, so, you know, maybe those are yours. Maybe you've got some real resolutions. For some people, uh, resolutions, you know, they really help because it helps set a goal out there. You know, okay, I've got 12 months. I'm going to get it done, and we've got a, a certain thing. For other people, maybe you're like, you know, this just turns into a broken promise and a failure every year. What's the point? And so it doesn't do any good. Um, Or maybe you're like uh, Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes. Anybody remember them? Here's Calvin. Resolutions, me. Just what are you implying? That I need to change? Well, buddy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfect the way I am. Maybe you come from that attitude. Like, what's what's the big deal? If everybody everybody else around me would change, everything would be okay. Um, But obviously... Uh, we do need to change, we do need to grow. Um, and, you know, what's the, the problem with making resolutions is that often we don't keep them. The problem with not making resolutions is maybe we don't grow and change. And we all need to grow and change. We need to grow and change uh, physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually. You know, if we never grow emotionally, we become a burden to our friends and our family. If we don't grow and change physically and don't adapt, our bodies decay faster. And we're not ha- we don't have the energy or the, the resources to minister to others. If we don't grow and change spiritually, then we're never really applying what God is trying to do in our lives. And so we want to grow and we need to change. The question becomes, what's the best way to do that? Is it by making res- New Year's resolutions? Or maybe there's some other way. And I'm convinced that there's even a better way and a different way, and we're going to learn some this morning. Uh, We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1, if you want to turn there and look it up on your your device or whatever. Um, Just to explain, as I said, uh, uh, John and and Jeff asked if I would uh, uh, fill in this morning, and as I prayed about it and thought about it, um, I thought about, well, Lord, what do you want me to, to speak on? And I realized there's no New Year's Day in the Bible. Uh, they didn't celebrate it. They didn't, it just didn't enter scripture anyway. The closest you could find is in uh, Exodus, I think it's Exodus 12, when God says, okay, with the Passover, you know, this is going to be the first month of the year for you going forward. Um, but it doesn't even show that they really celebrated a new year. It was more the, the thing from the Passover. So I prayed about it, and I thought, you know, this question came to mind, and I just felt like God was wanting us to take a look at it, didn't have any agenda or preconceived idea with it, but the question is, why are you still here? And we're going to look at that this morning. Now in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, we'll read it here together. It says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had, been, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen, to these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. 
For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel, kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So by way of introduction a little bit, the book of Acts was written by Luke, the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Luke was a doctor, he was a physician. And um, the book of Luke deals mainly with the, the life and ministry of Jesus. And then the book of Acts picks up at the very end of Jesus' life with the ascension and goes on to tell the story of the early church. Um, which, and and uh, it starts off when he's talking about Theophilus. Theophilus was a Roman official of some kind that Luke knew in some way. And basically Luke was writing an account or testimony of Jesus' life and ministry in the early church so this Theophilus could know about it and learn about it. Um, and in verses 3 through 5, uh, there we have about Theophilus. In verses 3 through 5, basically Luke says, okay, there was a 40-day period from the resurrection until Jesus' ascension into heaven, and during that time he ministered to others and appeared to others and stuff. We're going to primarily focus this morning on verses 6 through 11 of this passage in Luke chapter 1. And we're going to see three main lessons we can learn about growth from this. So if, uh, if we go to the next slide there, or if we go to um, lesson number one. Uh, the first one, first lesson is to let go of past priorities. If we look at, at verse 6 of Acts chapter 1. So when they had come together, they were asking him, the disciples were asking Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom of Israel? So they're asking him this question. Why did they ask him this question? Well, because they assumed, okay, you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel, right? That's what it's all about. Um, they were asking about, okay, now are we going to go back to the glory days? Now are we going to go back to the good times? You know, the, the, the disciples, they were, they were good Jewish men, and they had heard so many of the stories and knew the truth of the kingdom under David, the king, kingdom of David and the kingdom of Solomon. And when Israel was at its, its, its highest point, and, you know, even today, I mean, what's the, what's the symbol on the, star, on, the, on the flag for the country of Israel? It's the star of David. They still recognize today Israel was at its best under David. And now the Messiah had come. Jesus was the Messiah. And the disciples knew that. And they had seen him and they had talked with him. And the Old Testament picture of the, of the Messiah that they had during the, the first century, during Jesus' day, was much more a, a conquering king, a political figure, a, a general. I think it'd be kind of similar to, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, the character of Strider, who's, who's the king who comes back and kind of restores the, the, the justice in the land and the righteousness and stuff there in, in those books by Tolkien. It was a figure of a, of a strong leader and a warrior. And they had seen Jesus, and he, had, he was a great teacher, and they'd seen him do miracles, and then they'd seen him crucified, and he conquered sin and death, and he had, he had risen again. Okay, so Lord, now we're getting back to that, right? Back to those glory days. Um, in Matthew 24, 3, the disciples had even asked him this before. This is before the crucifixion, but during that last week when they're in Jerusalem, and it says, as he, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, oh, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They had already asked him, okay, when is the kingdom coming back to Israel? And Jesus explains some things and then gets to verse 14 of Matthew 24. 
And he's trying to teach me. He says, the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And he gives more teaching in that chapter about the end times. So this wasn't a new question that the disciples were asking Jesus. They're saying, we know you're going to bring back those, those good old days. Is it now? Finally? What are the glory days that you long for? What are the good old days that you wish were going on now? Maybe it's something that you've heard about. Maybe it's back in our nation's history with the founding fathers. And boy, if we could, if we could you know, live out those principles and the Constitution, those kind of things, and, and society would follow those and, and things would be right. Maybe it's the glory days that you heard about or lived from your, from your school, from your college or high school or something, back when you're, you know, your team was at its best and, you, and, and everybody knew it and, and you could walk around town with pride and because you were at that school or, or maybe it was some glory days as such in your family. Maybe it was when a few years back or something when your kids were younger and there wasn't difficulties and there wasn't issues and rebellion and different things going on or, or maybe it was the glory days here at our church and whatever that means to you, if that was... 60 years ago or six months ago. Maybe it was when such and such a family was here and you enjoyed fellowshipping with them or, or there, that program or that ministry was going on and now it doesn't anymore. And, and boy, when can we get back to those? You know, it's, it's so easy to yearn for those glory days. But we need to let go of those past priorities. You know, the thing that the disciples were asking about, restoring the kingdom to Israel, wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't a bad idea, but it was something from the past. I'd like us to think about who is more interested in the ultimate restoration of the kingdom of Israel, Jesus or his followers? Obviously, Jesus. He's the one who wants to sit on the throne here on earth, and he will one day, and the nations will worship him. But he's got his timing and his way to do that. Now, who is more interested in your health and growth in 2017? Jesus or you? Jesus, obviously. We can let go of those past priorities and leave those in the past and look to what Jesus has for us in this coming year, has for us individually, for our families, for our workplace, for our church, for our community, for our nation, and go with that. And sometimes that hard part is letting go of those, but if we will, we'll be following the example here of what Jesus laid out for the disciples. So to let go of those past priorities. I think the second lesson we can see is, is here in verses 6 and 7 too. And it's to let Jesus redirect our focus. In Acts 1, 6 and 7, it says, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. The disciples are asking, when are you restoring the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus redirects them completely. He says, don't worry about the wind. I'm not going to tell you about the wind. It's not for you to know. He even had said earlier in his ministry that the Father would be the one to decide when he would return to earth. That was up to the Father to decide. We didn't have to worry about it. The disciples were asking about the when of the kingdom while Jesus was answering about the how of the kingdom. And he answers that for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because he says... He says, it's not for you to know about the times or epochs, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and even in the remotest part of the earth. That Jesus was establishing a spiritual kingdom, not a political one. The political one will come someday. One day Jesus will return. He will rule the earth, and it will be political as well as spiritual. But at this time, and for them, it was a spiritual kingdom, not a political one. And he's redirecting them completely. He's not answering their when question. He's answering the how question. How was he going to, to uh, establish that? It's really interesting. It says Jesus was establishing 
not like I say, not the political kingdom, the spiritual one. And if we can look at the next slide here. Um, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even the remotest part of the earth. And this is the focus of his new kingdom. First, it's going to be accomplished through his followers. You see what they asked him? They said, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus says, no, no, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come. It was, a, it was Jesus was the one who made it possible but it's going to happen through his followers, empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were expecting him to do all the work. He'd be the one to ride in on the white horse and the sword and conquer everything. And they just kind of follow him down the road. And he says, no, 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 no. I already conquered sin and death. Now you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit to accomplish this. It was going to be accomplished through his followers. It was going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, remember, the Holy Spirit had not yet come when they were talking about this. That's why he says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, who would come in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. But when the Holy Spirit came that day and the church began, then he never left. The Holy Spirit still remains. And when we follow Christ, and when we have Christ in our lives, and we're, we're walking with Jesus, when that begins then we receive the Holy Spirit personally. He comes, he seals us, he baptizes us, he comes into our lives, and he doesn't leave. And we can choose to walk with him, be filled with him or whatever, but we have the Holy Spirit if we're a follower of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to wait for anything anymore. They had to wait a few days, we don't have to wait anymore. And the Holy Spirit was going to be the one doing all the power. And then thirdly, it was going to be far-reaching. It's going to be Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Basically, he's saying, okay, you're going to be my witnesses in town, in Jerusalem. You're going to be my witnesses outside of town and across the tracks, Judea and Samaria, and then everywhere else, uttermost parts of the earth. What's our Jerusalem today? Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your neighbors, your neighborhood, that which is closest to you. What's our Judea and Samaria? Now, Judea was the surrounding area around Jerusalem. Samaria was, well, there was like southern Israel, and there was a northern area, in the middle there was just some area. Right? Samaria. <laughs> there we go. It's no Bible college joke. Sorry. Um, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along together. Didn't get along well. We have the story of the Good Samaritan. And you're probably pretty familiar with that. So what's our Samaria? It's the other side of the tracks. It's the other side of the tracks for wherever you are. It could be the other side of the tracks uh, racially, ethnically, politically. Maybe when you went into the voting booth a couple months ago, you knew exactly who you were going to be marking that box for no matter what was happening. And you checked that box. And maybe your neighbor across the street or your coworker down the hall, or your classmate at school, or whatever, knew six months before, they were checking the other box. There's your Samaria. Maybe it's somebody that economically is different from you. Maybe you've got a stable paycheck, you know, you got your retirement taken care of, you got this, you got that, and maybe there's somebody who's really struggling that way. And they've had three or four jobs this last year because they can't keep one. And maybe... God is sending you to reach to them, to show them your, his love, to talk to them about his love. What's your Samaria? There's a lot of possibilities around. What's it, uh, you know, um, if you don't have in mind where your Samaria could be, first pray, who does God want you to share that love with and, sh and talk to about that? And then start looking around. Uh, I'm going to pick on Phil Amanda Olson. I've been doing a ministry with, with uh, Meredith and, and Hoover High School kids and their families, and they're reaching out to kids and families that really need some help, that really need the love of Jesus, and that really need some physical help. If you don't quite know who your Samaria is, talk to Phil afterwards, and he's got a whole school full of people he can help you reach. They're going to reach the othermost parts of the earth. 
And what's that going to mean for us? What's that going to mean for me? Maybe it's, it's, it's praying for and being connected with the Jacksons and the, and the Leitners and what they're doing overseas or the many other families that, are, that our church supports. And it's keeping up with them and praying for them and financially helping them out, supporting them. Maybe it's going on a missions trip. I think there's a meeting this week for a trip to, is it Uganda? Um, that, uh, that you could, hey, Lord, do you want me to take on that trip? It's some other opportunities we have here at church. Maybe it's reaching out to the thousands and thousands of immigrants that are flooding our city. We've got, if, if you don't know any, walk across our parking lot to the apartment buildings next door. There's Iraqi families, there's Hispanic families, there's others right in our neighborhood. Our, our, our city has a, a very large Sudanese population and many Ethiopians. And I, I see them because of where I work, they come in and apply for jobs. And we try to help them out. And, and the Lord is bringing the nations to our city. Get to know somebody. He said, well, I don't know any of them. We'll pray about it. Pray and say, hey, God, if you want me to reach out to somebody, then will you line it up so I can? And maybe next time you go to the gym, they're going to end up using a locker next to you. Or next time you, you, whatever, go to that coffee shop, and they're going to be the one handing you your coffee. And you can start a relationship, start a friendship, a conversation. Because, remember, it's not up to us. Jesus accomplished it. He empowers us through the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to be a part of it. But we need to let Jesus redirect our focus. Okay, so kids, I was going to say that I said that I was going to try to not make it boring. Do we have a picture to, to uh, show up here? Okay, this, only the kids can answer. What's the picture on the right? Any kids know? What do you think it is? The Capitol, right. Iowa State Capitol. It's downtown. Anybody know what the picture on the left is? Wallace, Wallace Building, yeah. It's a picture of the Capitol reflected in the Wallace Building. The Wallace Building is right across the street from the Capitol. If you're looking at the Wallace Building, it's a glass building. You're looking at the Capitol, it's all distorted. It's all kind of mixed around. Turn 180 degrees and you see the Capitol. Sometimes that's what we need Jesus to do for us. We need to let him do that. We need to let him change our perspective, change our focus, so we can focus on what he has for us and see it clearly. So we're going to let go of past priorities. We're going to let Jesus redirect our focus. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, thirdly, we're going to let the, let the familiar fade away. And that can be a really hard one to do. Let the familiar fade away. Acts chapter 1, verse, starting verse 9. And after, he had, after Jesus had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. In my mind, and I hope this isn't taken the wrong way, but this is one of the most humorous stories that I see in Scripture. Because you got the disciples, they're meeting with Jesus, He's telling them this, he's teaching them, and they're standing there on this hillside where they've probably been before, and he's telling them all this stuff, and he starts to go up. Now, they'd never seen an elevator, an escalator, or an airplane, or hang glider, or parachute, or anything like that. He starts rising up into the sky. And they're... Do you see that? Where, where'd he go? What, what? And he goes up, and they're standing there. How long do they stand there, I wonder? Was it 10 seconds? Was it 30 seconds? Was it 10 minutes? Was it, it, in my mind, I don't mean this in a bad way, but in my mind it was long enough for the Lord to say, okay, you guys go down, tell them that they got to get, get going here because don't stand around looking for me. Jesus sends them two angels. And what do the angels ask him? Why are you still here? Don't stand around looking up into the sky. Jesus is going to come back in the same way, but you need to get moving on. They'd become very familiar with Jesus, which was fine. They had heard him teach. They'd followed him for three plus years. They'd seen him risen again. He offered to let them put 
their hands in the holes in his, in his hands and his side. And they'd become very familiar with Jesus. And now he was gone? What's with that? So they ask him, so they say, why are you still here? What are the familiar things we need to let fade away with 2016? So that we can be open to what God has for us in 2017. Some of those familiar things might be good things. Obviously, them have, being with Jesus wasn't a bad thing. It was a good thing. But Jesus himself had told them in John 16, 7, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I will go, I will send him to you. He had promised them, he had told them, the Holy Spirit is going to come. He's going to empower you. He's going to teach you. He's going to remind you of what I've said. But if I don't go, he won't come. So he had to go. They had to let him go. What are those good, familiar things that you need to let go with 2016? Maybe it was a past ministry that you've been involved with. Maybe it's been something you've been doing for, for a long time and, and, and it's been a good thing and you've been involved with it, but maybe the Lord is, is leading you and nudging you to, to step on to something else. And once you do, he's been nudging that other person to step into what you've been doing. But as long as you're there, they can't step in. And God wants you to step out of that. Maybe it's some kind of past routine or tradition of some kind in your family. And there's been nothing wrong with it. But you just need to let it go. You probably know the story of the, you know, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the husband was, was at home and his wife was, was cooking a ham and, and she gets out the ham and she cuts off the ends and she puts it in the pan to, to cook and stuff. And he's like, honey, why, why do you cut off the ends? It looks like that'd be good meat to eat. She said, well, that's how my mother always told me to, to prepare a ham. Well, why? Well, I don't know. So next time she's talking to her mother, she said, you know, Mom, when you used to cut off, you know, prepare the ham and you cut off the ends, you know, why, why'd you do that? Well, honey, that was because that's how my mother told me how to prepare a ham. Oh, well, why, Mom? Well, I don't know. So the next time her mom's talking to the grandmother, she said, you know, Mom, you remember when you prepare a ham and you cut off the ends? You know, why, why'd you do that? I said, well, honey, my pan was too small. I couldn't fit the whole ham in there. Sometimes we have routines or traditions or whatever that, that had a purpose when they started, but maybe today they're not really necessary or important or whatever, and we can let go of those. Maybe some of those familiar things aren't good, but they're negative. Maybe there's a past grudge or unforgiveness of some kind from that person, and they, and they really hurt you, and that was really rough. And you really didn't deserve what they did to you or said about you or the rumors they spread about you or the whatever it was. And it's just, just a little bit comforting to kind of hang on to that. You know, boy, if I, if I met them in the hall, I'd really let them know what I think. If I just could see them alone, boy, I'd, I'd give it to them. I've rehearsed that script so many times and we need to let it go and forgive them. But they never asked for forgiveness. That's okay. You can still let them go. Because you're being held in bondage as long as you hold on to that grudge. And once you forgive them and let it go, you can be free. And maybe God will bring them to you to ask that forgiveness, and maybe he never will. Leave that to him. We can let go of those grudges. Maybe it's a past failure of some kind where you know that you let somebody else down. And you tried your best and you didn't have bad intents, but you let them down and you failed. Maybe you failed in a job. Maybe you failed your husband or your wife or your kids. Maybe you failed in a ministry God gave you and you felt like you let the Lord down. And you just can't get over that. You know, I'd, I'd like to do X, Y, or Z, but I just can't because I messed up that time and I know that if I try again, I might just fail again. And you need to let it go. You need to let go of those past failures. Because the Lord understands. What are the familiar things that we need to let fade away from our church in 2017? Maybe those can be painful or difficult to let go. But if we do, 
then the Lord can start to work with us. So, as 2017 begins, we can let go of those past priorities. We can let go. We can let Jesus redirect our focus. And we can let the familiar fade away. And as we look at this question, why are you still here? That's what, in essence, in my opinion, what the angels were asking the disciples. Why are you still here? Jesus went up. Go ahead and keep moving. Why are you still here in 2017 on this earth? We all are, or you wouldn't be listening to what I'm saying. For some reason, God has you here. Helen Phillips, bless her life and testimony and the years that she served here at our church and in our community and this body. But the Lord didn't have a purpose for her in 2017. And today, she's in a worship service, if you would, whatever you want to call it, that will beat ours any day a week. And she's enjoying Jesus face to face. And we can rejoice for her. But we're still here breathing, so God has some purpose for us here now. What is it? Ask the Lord that. God, what is it that you want to do in me and through me and stuff in this year? Why are we still here? Why are you still here now at this church today? If you're here visiting with us, thanks for being here. We hope you come back again. We hope you feel welcome. If you're not visiting but you're usually here, why are you still here? What does God have for you here in this body during this year? Some people used to attend here and don't anymore. But you're still here for some reason. Why? Why? What does God want to do? Because he's moving. He's going to do things. Remember, he's going to accomplish his work through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can be a part of that. Ask the Lord. Lord, what's, what's the ministry you want me to, to be involved with? How can I serve? What's the gifts you've given me? Who are those people that need somebody coming alongside them to encourage them or pray with them or, or nudge them along? And then take that step. Okay, I, I can do that. I can do this much and take that step and then take the next one and then take the next one. You know, maybe New Year's resolutions help to move you along those steps and if they do, then it's great to use them. Maybe they just discourage you from doing it. Then don't use them. But I think as we follow what Jesus gave as an example for us in Acts chapter 1 to the disciples, then we can move forward in the year to come and be blessed by him and give him the glory for all that he does. Why don't we close in a word of prayer? Just before we do, if, if uh, you're here and you would like somebody to pray with you or for you afterwards, we'll be down here up front and you can uh, certainly come up and, and be happy to talk with you. So, excuse me, why don't we go ahead and pray now. Our Lord Jesus, thank you that uh, you have accomplished your good work. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony from Acts chapter 1 of uh, your challenge to us to follow you, to trust you, and to act in the faith that you give us. God, thank you that you brought us into another year. I pray that we would give you all the glory for all that you do in us and through us this next year, and that we would please you as individuals, as families, and as a body. We thank you for all of this, Lord Jesus, and we ask this in your blessed name. Amen.